As we now turn our attention to God's word for us this evening, let's uh, prepare our hearts in prayer. Please join me in prayer. On this holy night, O oh God, whisper words of love into our ears as the significance and magnif magnificence of a child born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago penetrates our hearts and seeps into our souls. Speak, O oh Lord, for your servants are listening. Amen. And our scripture this evening is a familiar one in the second chapter of Luke, the first 20 verses. Hear the Christmas story once again. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David, called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste. And found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in a manger. And when they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So throughout these four weeks of Advent, we've been focusing on certain characters of Christmas. <clears throat> so we've talked about shepherds and King Herod and Mary and Joseph. <clears throat> now it's time and appropriate on Christmas Eve that we talk a little bit about baby Jesus. Now I have to warn you, perhaps in your mind you have an image of what you think you might know or how it happened, and maybe that'll be challenged tonight. But I invite you to hear once again the story and maybe the real <coughs> birth of Jesus. Because contrary to popular belief, Jesus' birthday is not December 25th of the year zero. He was actually born about six or seven years before the year zero. Because in the sixth century, when they were putting the, uh, what we call the modern calendar together, there was a miscalculation. Somebody added instead of subtracted or something, and they missed the year that Jesus was born. And so really, he was born about six or seven years before the year zero. He also wasn't born on December 25th. You see, the, the Roman Empire at the time that, that ruled everything in the year 274, 
Well, it was now more popular to be a Christian now that Constantine had converted himself. And so they weren't being thrown to the lions anymore or killed for being Christians. It was now okay to be a Christian. So they were looking for a day in which to celebrate Jesus' birth. Well, there happened to be, at that time, a pagan holiday called the Birthday of the Unconquerable Sun. And what it was is a celebration of the winter solstice and a victory of light over darkness. And so after the longest night of the year, then the days would start to grow longer and longer and slowly light would overcome the darkness. So the Roman Empire decided hey, let's make Jesus' birthday the same day as another national holiday that we have because Jesus is also an unconquerable son, S-O-N, and is also the light that is not overcome by the darkness. And so as they celebrated light, as they celebrated the sun, they celebrated Jesus. We now believe Jesus was probably born in August or September, but it's okay to still celebrate tomorrow. Jesus was born in a stable, but it may not be the kind of stable that's uh, in your nativity set. Because you see, in Bethlehem in that time, Bethlehem is all made of limestone. And so the stables in those days were actually kind of hollowed out caves in the middle of the limestone is where they would put their livestock. So when you think of the stable that Jesus was born in, Picture a dark cave teeming with animals because as we know at that time, the city was completely overcrowded because of this registration that was taking place. So we have the year, the date, and maybe a better picture of the place of where Jesus was born. We turn now to scripture, Luke's version of the birth. And he said while they were there in Bethlehem for this registration that the time came for her to deliver her child and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them at the inn. It's such a picturesque, beautiful, serene, peaceful description. Obviously Luke had never given birth because you mothers can testify out there, there's not a lot peaceful and serene about the labor and delivery process. Maybe afterward, when the child has arrived, there's a sense of joy and peace and serenity, but during the labor process, not so much. And so what could it have really been like that Mary had gone through that evening? Because we know she was about a 15-year-old kid. It was her first child, and she became pregnant in a very unique situation that probably her town, maybe even her family, knew or believed her, and maybe they didn't. But it came time for Joseph to have to travel, and she had to go with him. Now, she's nine months pregnant. You don't have to have been pregnant. You only have to use a little bit of your imagination to think that being nine months pregnant and traveling 80 miles on a donkey was not a pleasant experience. That's like going from, what, here to Richmond on a donkey, nine months pregnant. Okay? Uncomfortable to say the least and probably pretty painful along the way. And a very slow process, too. I mean, no wonder they got there after everybody else did. And the inn was, all, all the inns were full because Mary had to go to the bathroom every 10 minutes. She's nine months pregnant. So here she is on this donkey being jostled around. And no doubt that's what started the labor process. Because when they got to Bethlehem, she's already having contractions. They know that the time is near. And so here you have Mary in a strange place at the age of 15, about to give birth. You've got Joseph, who is just a carpenter. What does he know about labor and delivery? He is desperate, just trying to find a place for her to have her baby. 
And so he's knocking on doors and doing everything he possibly can to find a place for her to give birth. And ultimately, where they end up is a dark cave full of animals and everything else that goes along with animals. It was not the ideal scenario. Certainly not what she had pictured. They were scared. They were alone with no family, no, with no midwife. And at this time in the life of this couple, I wouldn't be surprised if she's kind of giving him a piece of her mind at the moment. You know, like if it wasn't for you and your family tree, I'd be home right now in Nazareth with my mom and in a proper bed with blankets and getting the care I needed. This is all your fault. As she experiences some of the worst pain in her short 15 years of life. And the contractions get stronger. And there's no OBGYN. There's no sterile environment. There's no epidural. And so there she is. And it's time to push. And her water breaks. And Joseph is there, confused and scared and doesn't know what to do. And getting this baby out is going to take every ounce of strength that she can muster. And God slips into this world, wet and wrinkly and vulnerable, small and helpless, just like every other child that enters into this world. There's no baby warmer, no Apgar test, no IV fluids. Just mother and baby, exhausted, cold. She tries to clean him up the best she can and, and wraps the, the cloth around him. Joseph has got to find something to tie the umbilical cord and cut it. And she holds her newborn baby. I would think sooner rather than later, they quickly fall asleep, completely exhausted from a very long day. Because you see, I have every reason to believe that Jesus came into this world just like every other human child. Amidst the, the chaos and the messiness and the pain and the beauty and the joy and the miracle that giving birth is all about. I have every reason to believe that the Messiah, the anointed one, God himself was birthed just like every other human child. And that's how God usually works. In the ordinary, in the chaos, in the messiness, in the pain when we find ourselves in those dark caves that we hadn't planned on. This isn't how Mary was supposed to have her baby. This isn't what she had expected or planned. But there she was. And God was born right there in their midst. Because you see, more often than not, when God comes to us, there aren't always bright lights and heavenly angels and, and rich people coming to bring us expensive gifts. More often than not, God comes to us and can be found in, in the ordinary and in the chaos of life. And God is birthed in grocery stores and traffic jams and changing diapers and washing dishes and going to work and going to doctor's appointments. And all the, the ordinary things that we do every single day, that's where God is found. That's where Jesus is birthed in our lives. God can be found in the messy homes and in the chaos and in the list of too much to do and not enough time to do it. So don't wait 
for something spectacular or dazzling from God. On this Christmas Eve and in the year to come, look for God in the ordinary events of your life. Look for God in the ordinary people in your life, in your family, in your coworkers, in your neighbors. Look for God on, in, in those who are homeless and those in prison and the children and those in assisted living places because that's where God is found. Not always in the decent and in order. And I don't know about you, but that brings me relief because my life is usually in the chaos and messy end of the spectrum than in the decent and in order end. So my friends, it's good news. It's good news that Jesus' birth was not some heavenly, picturesque, pristine scenario, but instead it was painful, it was messy, it was chaotic, just like you and me. So this Christmas Eve, remember that Jesus comes in the chaos and in the messiness of life. You don't have to have your life together to invite Jesus to be a part of it. Your heart doesn't have to be perfect and clean with no problems and no dark caves in order for Jesus to be born in your hearts once again. And so even in the darker and dirtier and messier and caves of life that we sometimes just get forced into, not by design, not by plan, totally unexpected. Oftentimes, that's exactly where God is to be found. So we thank God for the incarnation. We thank God that Jesus was born just like every other human child. And we thank God that God is found in the messy and in the chaos of life.